I now call the meeting of the Amateur Detective Club to order. I'm Tyler Riley, cop and a half. I'm Melissa Maley, the spy. I'm Tristan Miller, the saucy sleuth. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash adcpod and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash adcpod. Who's reading books? Anyone want to recommend, make a recommendation? <laughs> Who's reading books? <laughs> You got me when I was drinking water. <laughs> That's when everything is the funniest. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, as you know, I'm illiterate, <laughs> even when it comes to ears. <laughs> You're illiterate in the ears. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm like, I can hear talking, but I can't hear reading. Ooh. Um, <laughs> what about you? What if you had dyslexia of the ear? Like everything, as in the fucking in the gut, you know, came through that way. Wow. If you were trying to listen to a book. Is that a thing? I no. want No, definitely not. No, I was just what ifing. I mean, because people sometimes when they read, some people when they read, they can see, like, they see different colors and patterns and stuff, mm. which is mm. amazing. I'm dumb. I. Death in the Clouds, an Agatha Christie novel on which this episode is based. We've reviewed it. We've reviewed it specifically, the audiobook, narrated by Hugh Fraser. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Good book. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> did we like the book? We'll get into I it. I did. I remember liking it. Did you? Hmm. I remember liking it because it had a B on the cover. Well... <laughs> Oh, oh boy. <laughs> Those are my qualifications. And once again, I'm illiterate, so it's just about the aesthetics. Well, I would take points off just for it having a bee on the cover because it's a <gasps> wasp in the book. Well, it is a wasp, but I wanted to. <laughs> I think we talked about this when we reviewed the book. Uh, 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 the book. Um, wait, how many times have you gotten stung? Oh, yeah, we did talk about this. We did, yeah, we did talk about it. Uh, Too many for me. A bunch. I got stung near the eye once. That's terrible. Looked like Forrest Whitaker for two days. Oh, oh no. Boy. Um, Yeah, a couple times. None, like, none super terribly. I'm sure I, I recounted the story of when I was first stung because I thought it was uh, a leaf in my hair, but it was a bee. <laughs> Once, and then I said never again. <laughs> Where's the bee? So in um, the hierarchy of, you know, buzzing, stinging insects, um, bee-like insects, uh, I would rank it the absolute best are the bees. Because mm, they are productive. Yes. And then uh, don't like wasps. And then really don't like murder hornets. Yeah, hornets are bad, and then murder hornets. And then I would say at the worst, actually, are the, um, are horseflies. Yeah, they suck too. Because they're not scary enough to, like, warrant complaining. Right, but then they do bite and sting you pretty bad, and it sucks. Yeah, exactly. But like, it was like I was bit by a horsefly and people are like, just grow up. Whereas if you get stung by a wasp as a kid, you're like, yeah. oh, no. or a manslaughter bee. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are slightly better than the murder hornets. <laughs> yeah, only slightly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, third degree murder hornet. Yeah. God. The intent isn't to kill and the bee is just like, oh, oh, I feel really bad about this, but it happened. <sighs> well, yeah, yep. I remember as if I was at a, maybe I told this, I'm sorry if I've told this before, I was at a, a birthday party and I kicked a wasp's nest. Oh no. Like full on, I was just like swinging my legs and there was a, uh, on a bench and there was under the bench a wasp nest and I got like stung like five times. It was terrible. Oh, yeah, that would be pretty I, bad. I had a lot of bee incidents. <laughs> 
as a child. I just want to get to a point where we are prominent enough that people start doing fan art for us (laughs) so that someone will draw us manslaughter bees. (laughs) Oh, I've just a picture of me running from one. Yes. (laughs) Well, Well, this is good. Or someone, like, superimposes your face on that clip from My Girl. Oh, no. <laughs> You're covered in bees. I have never seen My Girl, and... I don't recommend it. Not because it's a bad think... movie, but... It's just... It's not a good time for anybody. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem like it. Um, but in this particular episode of Poirot, uh, Agatha Christie's Poirot, Starring David Suchet as Poirot, um, uh-huh. called Death in the Clouds, in case we hadn't made that clear yet. Uh, I do want to give a slight warning for uh, B Death. There is uh, a wasp that wasp that does get squished. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so be aware of that. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if they, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know if they put that on uh, doesthedogdie.com, the best website for me. Uh, and do they do it for like bug deaths as well? I don't think they do bug deaths. They do other animal deaths and like okay. specific, you know, uh, animal torture and that kind of thing. Uh, also, uh. Um, <laughs> there's like a certain music or a certain tone that always happens. And if I see a dog come on screen and that tone is going on, I'm like, Mm-mm, nope, pause. And I have to go quick and look up if anything bad happens to the dog. Can't handle it. Yeah, I hear you. Hmm. Yep. That is, for some reason. That's why the, I can't watch a thing. dog's purpose. Because nope. like, I know that the dog's spirit is fine, but like, I'm not really living like, multiple dog deaths. Like, Yeah, yeah. No Someone thanks. Someone pointed out. That in Batman, uh, the Dark Knight, Batman fil- full on kills like three dogs. <laughs> he just like completely demolishes three dogs. I didn't think he killed them. He threw them off the side of a building. <laughs> Did I? I don't remember that being a thing. I, I must totally have blocked this. That out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he completely just absolutely just. Ugh, it's not pleasant. It's also weird. I did there wasn't also like a balcony. Mm. I did also watch that movie before. Uh, basically, the reason I can't watch dog death in uh, movies anymore is because uh, is after my my dog died. Um, yeah, it it just yeah. for some reason. Uh, that you could probably figure out pretty easily psychologically. That is the reason that I stopped being able to handle it. Um, so I, mm-hmm. I saw that movie beforehand, so I don't remember it very well. Anyway, that's... There is bee death in this yes, episode. Yes, there is bee death in this episode. Um, but it starts with a plane ride. Mm. Um, uh, at... Don't it? No. It does not. <laughs> we get some Paris. We We walk around Paris for a little while first. Yeah, we well, get like 30 minutes of non-plane action before we get to the plane. No, I thought he flies to Paris, and then we get 30 minutes of Paris in the tennis match. I mean, I think I thought that that was implied, because I remember it opening on yeah. like a little Paris street. Yeah, we don't see oh. the plane until a bit later. I mean, But I mean, plane... he does take a plane to get It to... is implied, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, he's at one point he's absolutely white knuckling it, and I'm the exact same way. He's like gripping the the seats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That does happen in our in our big major plane ride. But I believe we only get two, we get two plane rides in this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so at the beginning, he's walking around Paris. We're meeting some people. There is, uh, Lady Harbury, Cecily Harbury, who uh, is absolutely insufferable um yeah the worst for real yeah she is i uh, she is the uh i need to speak to your manager person mm-hmm, mm-hmm. she look she makes like cruella de vil look nice 
Um, same same fashion. <laughs> same energy. Yeah. Aesthetic, though. Good hats. Uh, bad personality. Bad personality. Mm-hmm. Uh, Which I respect. I don't like, but I respect. I, I know what you mean. I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you see that she's having trouble with her husband. She has a uh, a maid who is dressed in terrible sweaters. Yeah, I was going to say, there's like, they were like, how plain can we make this woman look? Yeah. Yeah. And it looks like comical. It <laughs> it doesn't make sense. I, yeah, it's it, like, I just want to hand her a, a colorful anything. Um, <laughs> ooh. Instead of a burlap sack. Yeah, for real. Um, nothing flattering, this poor woman. Um, mm. And so we meet We meet all these people. She has some friends and stuff. Uh, yeah. we ha- mm-hmm. She throws some shade Poirot's way as well. When he right. happens, up, like when she notices him. She oh, says yeah. something rude about the French and he's just like, I'm not French. Yeah, no. <laughs> like, a- this is not bothering me. <laughs> yeah. You think it is, but it's not. Yeah, for real. I love that so much. Um, yeah, gosh, it just never ceases to amaze me how how much Poirot can shut people down while also appearing extremely pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I have the only way I've figured out how to get people to do anything is be just very nice to them. I wish I could be I, I wish I could be less nice and, and still convince people to do stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, just being pushy just, and polite is a difficult Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. A little more pushy. I'd love to be a little mm. bit more pushy while still Aggressively not Aggressively nice. Y- yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. Jessica um, Fletcher does it too. She's great. Yeah. Yeah, she's She's very good at that. It's very skilled. Yeah, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to tell you to do something, but I'm going to make it feel like I'm asking, and then also I'm going to be polite while doing it. Yeah, and then I'm um, going to smile at you, and you're going to do it. Mm-hmm. It's going to be great. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. And it both, I would say with both those characters, it comes from a societal expectation of them being unassuming, mm. with yeah. Poirot being a foreigner and Jessica being an older woman. Yeah. Whereas, like... With, like, for example, Jap, who, by the way, we get a lot of in this episode. Oh, he's which I love. so good. Which is wonderful. Um, he's, like, clearly, like, <laughs> and he's also, like, a detective of Scotland Yard, so people are a little less, like, willing to talk to him. They're yeah. intimidated by a tall white man with a mustache. Yeah. And a great hairline, actually. I noticed that we finally see him without a stupid hat on. <laughs> And there you go. Because I forgot to mention something like th- two episodes ago or whatever. At one point, he, when Hastings shows up again, it was the episode with the Cayman. Uh, mm. <laughs> for some reason, Jeff just is like, oh, you're picketing a bit like Poirot with your hairline. And he's just so mean for no <laughs> reason. <laughs> and I'm like, why do you have to be? He's so just being Jap. <laughs> yeah. Just Jap. <laughs> this would be a good one to get from uh the just jap perspective yeah uh yes yeah i will uh, email the writers promptly after this yeah recording. great sounds good <laughs> uh, no that's been off the air for four <laughs> uh no for our show just jap yeah <laughs> oh i see i see i see yes our writers you know um <laughs> Uh, but so we we meet all these people. Uh, there's a woman, Giselle, who is a money lender, and I then there's Jane Grey, who is a flight attendant that Jap meets outside of, you know, one of the Paris buildings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and later, you know, we find out she's a main character. They talk again about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they they talk about Jane Grey, the Nine Days Queen. Um, yes. No relation. Uh, 
But yeah, so. That... And then there's um, uh, a mystery writer. Oh, yeah. And an archaeologist. There's yes. a fun moment with. Uh... Uh, Dupont is mm-hmm. the archaeologist. Right. The professor and Marianne. Mm hmm. <laughs> uh, but there's a fun moment with uh, Poirot talking to Jap and another inspector where he says, you know, Daniel Clancy, the mystery writer. Mm-hmm. And they just stare at him. And it's so good. Yeah. It's like the main character, you know, this very famous character that everyone knows. <laughs> and they're like, huh? Based on me, probably. So he says, they're just, and, you know, of course, Poirot's very insulted in his way that they have not read any of this. Yeah. So, um, yeah. They're all there in Paris for the French Open. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, and we do go and see some tennis for a while. Yeah. For like a good five minutes, they just let these tennis players do what they do, which, you know, once again, I respect, but I'm like... Could you have spent more time on the mystery? We have like 30 minutes of just like dinking yeah. around yes. Paris. So At that much. point, I spilled coffee on myself and I did not pause it when I <laughs> went, got up to uh, to clean it off the floor and my my shirt. Uh, yeah, I just let it play. Yeah, We do get some fun stuff though between Poirot and Lady Hornsbury because they just keep running into each other. Um, at the, the tennis match, at the mm-hmm. um, I guess reception that sure. they have, where I guess like the VIP guests at the French Open makes sense, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, and yeah, and she's being horrible, and he keeps side eyeing her, <laughs> and she's like, "Is that like is that what this thirty minutes is about? Just getting some good Poirot side side eye?" <laughs> yeah, like I mean, we get it. We could do it in. 10 to 15 minutes, I think, at any rate. But we do over... Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Say what you're going to say. We do uh, over here, and what we see at the reception, uh, uh, what's the first name for Horsbury? Cecily. Cecily. We see Cecily uh, go over to um, Madame Giselle, Mm-hmm. And like alludes that like there is like some like unpleasantness between the two, perhaps to do with money, uh, because we also find out during this uh, the opening thirty minutes that she and her husband seem to be kind of hard up for money, and she keeps losing it at the casino. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah. got a gambling problem. Yeah, she's got a gambling problem. She also is clearly having an affair, as is he. They are not in a happy marriage in any respect. And he's even like, I'm going tomorrow. I'm going to leave. I'm just going to go back home. And she's like, before the final. And he's like, ah, darn. I do love tennis more than I hate you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so then they they have the the final. um, Then everyone just goes home yeah. on a plane. Yeah, everyone together. gets on a very, very small commercial plane. Which, okay, so I needed to talk about something. Okay. Um, number one, the plane itself is small. Um, number two, I wanted to know if they, like, at some points it feels like they had a model airplane and they green screened it for the traveling show. Oh, yeah. And at other points it feels like an actual airplane. And I need to know what's going on there. So if anybody knows. There's a lot of messiness with this episode. Yeah. But the set itself is so clearly a set. And I love it so much. (laughs) It's like so funny. And also it's very like as far as like small planes go. It's very spacious because it is first class. Yeah. Yeah. So they get on this plane. (laughs) Um and, Wait, we still uh, have five more exposition. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Like, it takes us a while to get to the plane. <gasps> <is all. laughs> yes. Uh, 
So they're on this plane, Poirot is falling asleep, which is another tactic I have when I have anxiety on a plane. I'm just like, I'm gonna just, I always have three hours of sleep before a flight, and I purposely do this just to be able to go. Um, so he falls asleep on the plane, but at one point, um, there's a, there's a wasp that bothers the mystery writer and the archaeologist, and the archaeologist squishes it, and it's pretty gross. Yeah, um, yeah. it's it, like a close-up. He takes his teacup and has the little wasp in his saucer and, like, takes mm-hmm. the teacup and just squashes it, and it's very close-up. It, it made it seem to me like that maybe it wasn't a real wasp that they killed. I was going to say the opposite. Of like it looks like they found a wasp, they put it on the plate, it starts moving, and he just. Mm, but like just... in his defense, he can't like let it out the window. Right, That's true. but it also seemed like I mean he could have covered it and just like let someone handle it. <laughs> um, but I mean I get for the re- like obvious reasons we don't get that. But the way it like, I don't know. It just felt like too clean. Mm. A kill, even for a wasp. Yeah, it felt like it should have been, you know, buzzing around for a little bit longer. I mean, no, I just meant like the separation. That's why. I th- I, that's why I think oh. it's fake. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. How would you make a fake wasp to kill? Well, I would assume you would find a wasp, kill it, and then just have a dead wasp to squish. You no, I thought like maybe way. like clay and like a little bit of paint. Hmm. It would look. If, if it is that, it looks very good. A glass wasp. Like, I'm not a props master. I don't know how this works. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird problem to have to solve for this script. How do you solve a problem like a wasp? Yeah. Um, which is also what we're facing in Congress. Um, mm. 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 Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're all... So um, there's a wasp buzzing around and Paul, there's the mystery writer and the arche- uh, archaeologist. Um, and then like halfway through the flight, um, at, at various points, and this is important later, the only people that go past Giselle, the older woman that is the money lender, mm-hmm. are the mystery writer, a flight attendant, and the maid. Right. Both She's flight attendants. Through. Both of the flight attendants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah both of the flight attendants. A certain point um which is important because halfway through the right as they're about to descend uh it turns out she's been been shot with a blow dart from south america and they make a big fuss about south america they do it's weird real weird and not great <laughs> yeah it's strange it's certainly weird <laughs> i wouldn't like I wouldn't qualify it as, like, racism per se, but it is weird. It's just, like, a weird fuss made about South America. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't have the words right now. Um, yeah, it just sits strange. So yeah, initially, they're like, the wasp stung her. Obs. And then the Poirot finds a blow dart and is like, no, it's clearly this dart that I just found. And we've got to be very careful because the tip is probably poison. <laughs> yeah, like, it was, like, so, like, they needed to make sure everyone who watched from the age of 5 to 95 understood what a dart is and what was in the dart. <laughs> Yes, it was very close up. You could see it, and it was uh, black and yellow, like a yeah, wasp. Like a wasp. And like, all... all right, guys. <laughs> yeah, we get it. And they also linger on it for like a good 20 seconds, and then obviously it was meant to cut to commercial. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever. Um, it's like the, the first act break. Um, so they land back in... London? Uh, yeah. London, so this is like a commuter met. jet, kind of. Yeah. Is, this it's is like... like mm-hmm. The L.A. to, like, Las Vegas. Like, Precisely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Except and, Europe, uh, you know, you have countries instead of cities. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you also have cities, but you can go between countries. Uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> 
Turns out there's a bunch of countries really close together in Europe. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. Yeah. Which is weird to think about because of how the United States works. Um, right. Yeah. It is. Anyway, um, so they land in England and Jap is there and he's questioning everybody. And of course, um, he once he sees Poirot, he's like, come, can you hang out with for a second? And then, of course, Miss Harbury, Mrs. Harbury is like, well, I knew there was something suspicious about him because she doesn't like him because he's foreign. Yep. Um, she doesn't like anybody, yeah. to be fair. I think... Uh, she likes the person that she's having an affair with. Yeah, um, well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you can you can have an affair with someone you don't like. Yeah, uh, yeah that's true. That's true. It happens Been all the there, time. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> no. Maybe. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I just realized that I'm <laughs> yes sometimes yeah. now I'm gonna uh, during episodes gonna be thinking about me having to transcribe the things that Thurston does <laughs> um, but yeah so they land and Jap is like can you go through all this stuff with me and he goes through all the items of everybody and Mrs. Harbury is upset because she's like this is you know undignified or whatever and um, we hang out with Jap and his assistant for longer than I thought in this scene. Yeah. Yeah. Because Poirot's like, I was asleep. I don't have any ideas. So I'm just going to go back to the waiting room. Not after um, he was slandered by Jap. <laughs> <laughs> no, that happens a little. That happens does, a little okay. Later. My bad. Yeah, it's okay. That's all right. Uh, yeah. Um, at one point, Jap, like, he's like, this is they go in the plane uh they find a piece of evidence and Poirot was like i'm sitting here and he's like oh well it's fine and he's like no Poirot must be up, hold, held up to the same standards as everybody else um but we hang out with jap and his assistant for a long time talking about the evidence after Poirot leaves it's kind of strange because mm. normally I feel like the scene would end when Poirot left. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's the titular character. But, um, but yeah, it's nice to see. Once again, it's really nice to see a lot of Jap. It is. Uh, we get a lot of evidence going on. Yeah. Um, playing with the flight attendants because they want to go clean up. The flight attendants are very annoyed that this is a murder scene and <laughs> they can't, you know, do their. Uh, do their housekeeping of the of the plane like they're like we want to clean we want to clean the coffee cups they're like it's a murder scene you can't come on (laughs) on board i'm sorry and um borrow takes them aside and asks them some questions um yes and that's when we find out about you know they both did pass by and saw her alive uh Mm -hmm. Like it, at one point, the male uh, attendant says that he saw her like just minutes before the whole kerfuffle with her death. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So kerfuffle with her death. <laughs> <laughs> so they go into the plane, Jap and Poirot, and they find that bit of evidence, which is a blow dart. Um, blow a pea shooter pipe. pipe. Blow, no, pipe. blow dart. That's a contest yeah. blow dart. From Murder Mystery. Murder I mean, this mystery. was yeah, clearly, yeah. you know, Inspired is where that writer that. got inspiration. I'm sure. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so. That Murder Mystery script just, you know, rife with very uh, inspired <laughs> very detail and. <laughs> subtle references. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> treasure uh, trove, a virtual treasure trove of. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and, and then is, is this when they, um, Jap phones up the inspector in Paris and they fly back to Paris? Uh, not, I mean, eventually that does happen. Um, we, I uh, feel like that's like the tagline for this episode. Eventually things do happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, basically we're doing a lot of clue gathering in some, yeah, in yeah. some order, 
Um, at one point, uh, Poirot goes to the writer Clancy's uh, home and he's like, you know about these uh, blowpipes. You have one that looks very similar. And he's like, but mm-hmm. I didn't kill her. Why would I kill her? Um, very he annoyed says, by it. Um, he was do, he has it for research for a book. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And Poirot's read all his novels, so he's like, that's just untrue. And he's like, the character wouldn't let me write the mystery. And he has this thing where his, he, you know, where his characters really speak to him and, like, the thing he has to follow what that intuition is. Right. Um, uh, we also learn that there was a salesperson that sold a blowpipe to an American man in, like, a coat. You know, big coat, trench coat looking thing. Perfect disguise, you know. Um, you know how there trench... three small children. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, we also uh, see that the maid of Madame Giselle is notified of her death, and she immediately begins to burn a whole bunch of papers. Yeah. Yeah. And we do learn that Lady Hornsbury uh, was being blackmailed by Giselle. Yeah. Um, and then all, all this while, Poirot has recruited... Uh, Miss Gray to be his assistant in lieu of Hastings. And can I tell you, this actress is so charming. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic performance from her. A plus. Yeah, I liked her uh, better in the this than in the book, I think. Yeah, yeah. she was fine in the book, too. Um, but all of this leads them back to uh, Paris because the daughter of Giselle rolled up and was like I would like to claim my inheritance please yeah so this is a long estranged daughter after getting married yes after getting married you see this wedding it's very strange we basically see a wedding uh you see the bride and then she takes off right after the wedding it's like peace and it leaves her husband at the altar after after getting married so like yeah. doesn't abandon him at the you know what I mean so yeah. <laughs> So uh, she she runs directly to the police station to say, money, please. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, this woman's got some very curly, very red hair. Um, yeah. And they're like, oh, okay. No, she hasn't seen her mother in many years. Her mother was had abandoned her. Um, and she's been living in Canada this whole time. We yeah. find out. Um, but we don't know who her husband is, who her new husband is. It's very confusing. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. <laughs> so Jap and Poirot arrive back in Paris. And before they meet with the inspector, they, they have a nice chat over breakfast. But and, uh, Sorry, um, on the plane, though? Uh, he, oh, right. He can... <laughs> Stupid. He gets up at the front of the plane with the blowpipe and yeah, is like various s- angles. Yeah, he's like staring around and he asks someone to move so he can sit in their seat uh-huh. and everyone is very creeped out by him. And Jap is like, could you please sit down? I love that Jap is whispering and, and Poirot is like shouting like an old man. <laughs> it's very funny. It's some solid bits. Um, it is really good. And, yeah. And then once they land, they are having breakfast, and Poirot's like, oh, I can't. I'm just so upset. And, uh, you know, I can't figure it out, and all this evidence, blah, 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 blah. Because as we, <clears throat> as we saw, you know, you, you couldn't, from any angle in the plane, pull out the blow dart and kill this person from an angle that makes sense. And uh, Jap was like, okay, so we have to look at the psychological moment when no one was looking, which is in the book a conclusion that Poirot comes to himself. Mm. Whereas it's really nice to give Jap a moment where he is a competent detective. (laughs) Yeah, that is nice. Poirot meets Anne, this daughter, and Mm. uh, (laughs) 
Uh, he he says that she looks very familiar. Like, hey, have I seen you before? And she's like, no, I'm sure you haven't. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, then. I've never seen the man before in my life. I'll just <laughs> file that away in my brain. Those mm-hmm. little gray cells. Um, if you are a liar. <laughs> um, but she says that her husband's name is Richards. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and then we... It's the first time that Poirot goes to see um, Giselle's house and meets the maid. And they remark about like how cold and sterile the place was. It didn't feel like anyone's home. Yeah. Um, and they have a scene. It's he and Jap. And the, the maid speaks only French. Mm-hmm. And Poirot talks the entire time. Isn't um, Lady Grey also there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, and they get out of the maid some information that, like, but I think all... never mind. Go ahead. This is where we find out about the long lost daughter, Exerta. Basically, uh, that she had been, uh, that she had been gone for like twenty three her years. entire life. Yeah, twenty three yeah. years, and she yeah. gives her a baby picture. Which yeah. Poirot later shows to Jap, and Jap is like, oh, perfect. Now we can go find her. <laughs> uh, but I, helpful. When uh, she does, uh, at one point, uh, Anne does produce her birth certificate, saying, no, 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 it's really me. Here's my birth certificate. I figured you might question me, mm-hmm. but I really want that money. So yeah, I, I thought she... ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Melissa. That's okay. Uh, because we do uh, with the French detective mm-hmm. that uh, Anne goes to originally, they had an appointment set up for the following day to which she never showed up for. Oh. So there is like that kind of hunt for her in the interim while they're interviewing uh, the French maid uh, mm-hmm. of Giselle's. And while they're doing this other business, nobody can find her. Right. Until she does come back. And it's like, hey, just kidding, guys. Sorry. Here's a birth certificate, as you were saying before. We then have uh, a scene in which Poro is uh, stymied. He can't figure it out. And uh, Jane realizes that she's snagged her nail and she needs to file it. Yes. And he goes, wait, what did you say? And she mm-hmm. says... I need to file my fingernail? Uh, And Mm -hmm. he goes, aha! And then we should take an ad break. We should. Uh, Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Uh, Hope you enjoy it. We'll see. Once so much confidence. Your... <laughs> yeah, like, listen, man, I know when we have a normal, like, an average fine episode. <laughs> you know, I think this one's going to be good. Yeah. Well, we'll, yeah. We'll, let's get it through. Tristan's we'll, we'll going to cut it. out a bunch of nonsense that we've. Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole part with bees that you're not going to know about. No, <laughs> the bee part's the best part. Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. No. You um, shut that down right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, what a good movie. Um, we're on the Scavengers Network, if you didn't already know that. You can go to scavengersnetwork.com, peruse all the excellent content there. Spooky Spouses. Uh, Morgan Needs a Podcast. You got a bunch of other good stuff that I'm, yeah, I can't think of right State now. State your case. There we go, which is a great, very funny premise um they've been doing a lot of live streams since uh the world changed so check those out as well um and the videos are up on their youtube as well so if you miss the live streams you can always just watch it later what's the website for that one again scavengenower.com hey forward slash forward slash 
HTTP. Nothing. Yeah. Dot. <laughs> 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 oh, God. <laughs> all one word. <laughs> oh, <sighs> sure. Uh, <laughs> yes. And you can find us on social media specifically at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at ADC Pod. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I'm working on a band camp. Uh, there's been some issues with the file size because band camp is weird. We have such big files. No, no like, no, they do. Just, it, it, I don't want to get into it, but I'm, I'm mad. Um, <laughs> but what's going to be on the, the band camp eventually, um, bandcamp.com slash ADC pod, um, are the commentaries we recorded for the Kenneth Bernard and the David Suchet version of Murder on the Orient Express. If you buy it, all the money goes to a Black Lives Matter adjacent charity of your choosing. Just put it in your notes when you buy it and where you want to go, what bail fund, what group, whatever you want to support there. So that should be going up within the this month at some point because I just moved houses and I have a lot to do. Yeah. Michael, what have you gotten Dad for Father's Day? Uh, what? It's so soon. <sighs> oh my god, we go through this every single year. Oh, quick, <laughs> help me think of something that Dad would really love and appreciate. Uh, wh- what do we know about Dad? Well, we know he loves murder. We know he loves mystery. <laughs> <laughs> and he loves podcasts. If Ugh. only there was some way <laughs> that someone combined all three of those things that you could, like, possibly get for Dad. Oh, look at this. A quick <laughs> Google search told me that the Amateur Detective Club has a Patreon. Hey! For $10 or less a month, like, you could get, like, I could shout out my dad on their podcast in an outbreak, and I could get early access to all their shows plus bonus episodes and content, like the video episode of Amateur Detective Club featuring Clint McElroy. From the famed podcast, The Adventure Zone? That's the one. Oh my god, Michael, who let these people in here? I'm a ghost. (laughs) We're bees on the wall. We we're just we've been here wall. we've been here the whole time, but we can talk. It's terrifying. <laughs> so perhaps this wasn't about Dad's gift, but all the bees we met along the way. <laughs> That's right. Join us at patreon.com slash ADC pod for all your Father's Day needs. What's the deal with these bees? <laughs> Dad, get out of here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, and now back to our bee podcast, (laughs) apparently. The Broads and the Bees, also on Scavengers Network. Check it out. Okay, back to the episode. Yes. So he has this aha moment, and he also has a moment with um, the male steward, as he's called, the male flight attendant, Mm -hmm. um, where they meet in a cafe after landing, and um, Jane has, by the way, Jane has got the hots for the archaeologist, Um, and they start, like, dating, essentially, and they go to the airport together and they meet there and she's all you know it's all sweet and stuff but he's like i don't want to talk to him um though he did donate 500 pounds to his expedition um <clears throat> and he sits down with the steward i think who's michael mitchell mitchell anyway sure um <laughs> and it doesn't matter he was Poor like, God. is there anything unusual and he's like well there were two spoons in giselle's saucer which you know that happens sometimes incredibly embarrassing though that's like is it or is the murder more embarrassing for your airline yeah and he says sorry it can't be more helpful and poro says oh no that's extremely helpful Mm -hmm. okay Mm -hmm. i guess great (laughs) uh yeah so then we have we go to our parlor reveal Uh, everyone's in fancy dress i missed why 
I mean, why not? Was it a dinner party? Poirot summons them for, to a dinner party. Right. Uh, before that, though, we should mm. talk about how... Oh! Anne's, oh! Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. important, isn't it? Yeah, kind of. Uh. <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> so, uh, Poirot goes to meet with Anne and asks her, you know, her relationship to all of these people, uh, like, all the other suspects that are involved. Like, did she know any of them? And what have you. Right. And she... It's there that they find out that she is not who... Or she is also another person? Yeah, they say that later. Okay. They find that out later, after. But, okay. But, uh, yes, no, after Poirot's aha moment with the nail file, he is like, uh, we have to find Anne. And they're like, okay, I guess so. Um, and they find her on a train, and she is dead. Mad uh, dead. Like, very dead. Yes, she is not mostly dead. She is entirely dead she's achieved 100 percent mortality she yes. was not sleeping with her eyes open no <laughs> correct she truly is no longer with us passed on uh, is it getting it... tiresome audience because that is how long they took on the gosh darn dart at the beginning of the, <laughs> of the episode for real <laughs> it's true uh so yes they they, uh, it seems like it's a suicide. That's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Um, because she's like a little vial of poison. And yeah. listen, extract of llama. Why would you do that on a train? Why would you do that in your own home? He puts it together, any, but he's put it together anyway. Mm. Um, and then that's when we get the parlor reveal. Okay. Yes. Back to that. Uh, so. He goes through basically all of the suspects and says how he had suspected all of them at one point. Of course, yeah. Lady Harbury seems very obvious because she uh, owes Giselle money and she's being blackmailed, but it wasn't her. Um, and even at first, uh, he thought maybe Jane Grey was was the killer, but no, indeed, it was not her either. Um, and... He recalls that he had uh, thought that Anne, uh, Giselle's daughter, seemed familiar. Mm -hmm. And he has put together that Anne is actually also the maid. Da -da -da -da. Who Surprise. had, yeah, who had been having a love relationship with. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's what I think happened in your mind. <laughs> you were gonna say affair, and you're like, "Well, she's not married." Yeah. And so she's like, "What? Quick, what do you call it when you, when two people are clearly like doing the deed?" Crap! 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 crap, crap. <laughs> <laughs> a relationship, but you can have relationships with anybody. A love relationship. Oh no, I have a love relationship with my dog. I love my dog. Oh, I don't know what we call it. Oh, crap, crap, crap. Oh, I've already said it. It's too late. It's too late for me. Ah! Tristan, you got it exactly right. That's a hundred percent what happened in my brain just now. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm gonna go with it though. Uh, he. She has been having a love relationship with. <laughs> yeah, that's my guy. Come on. <laughs> with uh, Norman Gale, who is the archaeologist. No, I okay. forgot to mention him. Oh, because he is a dentist. Did... And he's a he dentist. Does something insane. <laughs> because of when they find the body of Giselle. They go, is there a doctor? And he goes, I'm a dentist. I don't know if that helps. And everyone's like, it doesn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dentists are doctors too. They're, yeah. They're, they're doctors the same way a chiropractor is a doctor. I found them helpful. I mean, yeah, they're helpful, but like. They're bone doctors. 
<laughs> but <laughs> love relationship was <laughs> number one. They are bone doctors. Number two, so are dentists. Yep. Teeth are bones. That's you got right. bones in your mouth. You can't not taste bones. And every staff member at Grey's Anatomy <laughs> is a bone doctor as well. That's right. So, wait, okay. I'm confused then. Okay. Who is the archaeologist? He's French. Um, and he, and I misspoke. Jane Grey doesn't have a relationship with him. She has it with the dentist. Okay. That make okay. Then, I, then I'm good. I just yeah, forgot the archaeologist was, was there, Dupont I guess. Dupont is yeah. the archaeologist. Uh-oh. Yes. Um, uh. yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, so Gale, Norman Gale. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had been having this affair with uh with the maid um who no, she she is with the archaeologist then mm is the same person yes it is yeah Gosh, that's confusing it's a bit confusing God, this um, whole episode is so it turns out he is also an actor yep uh-huh. He's a dentist slash actor, which is a mystifying combination. But Well, I assume Wait. he wanted to be an actor, and then he was like, no, no, no. no. The, the actor is the person with um, Matt Lady Horsbury. Yeah. And he's just a dentist, and he, at one point, Poirot has him disguise himself as a reporter, to, and he tries to do a bad disguise, and Poirot's like, why? But, of course, to make sure that... Trying to oh, that's that right. he could never disguise himself as a steward because when they looked at all his luggage, he had all his dentist stuff with him, which is weird if you're and going a- on vacation. Yeah. And apparently uh, the dentist coat looks very much like the uniforms worn by uh, the stewards at that time. That empire error. Mm-hmm. Um, so... so- so he did have that in his luggage. Yes, the mm-hmm. actor. Sorry, I, I confused all three of these men. Uh, <laughs> it was not difficult to, unfortunately. Right. So um, the the actor is uh, the one having the affair with Lady Hornsbury, but mm-hmm. uh, turns out this dentist is a pretty good actor himself. Um, uh huh. So he he disguised himself as a flight attendant and with this dentist coat on the plane in the laboratory um and uh he put some cotton in his mouth to further disguise himself um you know making him which is he didn't he did not look that different but okay exactly the same yeah just like with puffy lips or whatever Mm -hmm. uh so that that is what he did and he walked over put the extra spoon in her saucer and because he had a spoon to be like, ah, oh, yes, I'm I'm doing flight attendant business. Yes, and uh, stuck a dart in her neck. Yeah, killing her. That is some fast actor poison, though. <laughs> yeah, right. She went more. <laughs> yeah, and no one was paying attention at this point, of course. Uh, and then yeah. he put the blow dart thing in uh, the seat in front of Poirot or next to Poirot, wherever, um, to throw people off. And I guess they had released the wasp as well to try yeah. and make yeah. it look like the wasp was the killer. Mm-hmm. The um, wasp was just supposed to be a red herring. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Much um, like communism. Yes. So uh, this, he Poirot gets him to admit that he committed the crime with a stupid thing because he goes and he kills um, Anne. The, yeah. the heiress after get, becoming married to her um, and it's because he suspects that Poirot is figuring everything out and he's like okay she's gotta go yeah and uh, he <laughs> gets him to admit that he did it by going well you forgot the fingerprints on the vial and he goes oh, that's impossible I wore the glove oh f- you yep so yeah, you played he... yourself, in the words of DJ Khaled. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly right. And, and uh, I was like, another one. 
<laughs> we the uh, best murders. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, he, of, of course, uh, Jane is pretty distraught that uh, this dude she was dating um, was A, married, and B, a murderer. Um, and mm-hmm. she asks, why'd you do it? And he says, Jane, for a whole lot of money. Uh, it goes off to jail and uh, Poirot t- assures Jane that he was in love with her, which is like, I guess, great. Cool. I mean, I, I guess that's, does that make it at all better? Does it? Does it, does it make, make it, it better? Worse. I feel like, I don't know. Uh, it's just a strange way to end it. Uh, it's better than the way the book phrased it. What What did the book do? I forget. The book was like, well, be lucky we caught him because you were next. Oh, right. <laughs> Just That's like, right. Dang. Well, I mean, yeah. but more believable, right? Yeah, like, definitely. Yeah. Uh, it's like, you know, if you have one woman at the bottom of a staircase and then another woman at the bottom of the staircase... It seems less like an accident. <laughs> it seems like less of an accident when it happens twice to the same person. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I remembered liking this book, and I remembered thinking the episode was fine. But as we recounted it for you, dear listener, my rating slowly, slowly diminished. <laughs> To, I think, a two out of five or a one and a half out of five. Because looking back at it, it's incomprehensible. Yeah. I'm sorry. Did I step on your toes, Tyler? Is that why you're like, boom? No, no. The dog did something oh, okay. weird. Um, okay. No. Uh... Doing some sleight of hand magic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but I I agree with you. Uh, but I didn't like the book, from what I recall. Like I think I found like I was quite middling in how mm. I felt about it. Um, and yet this felt to me this episode was just one that could have been an hour long and mm. been fine. It just felt like too many things were just stretched out that didn't need to be stretched out, and the things that needed to be fleshed out were rushed. And yeah. I don't know where and why that happened. Mm-hmm. And then there was also like you would have like these wonderful Parisian scenes, and then you got like essentially like this pulled from the nineteen twenties bit of film by the Arc de Triomphe. And it's just like it's clear that you're not in Paris then because you would have just taken actual <laughs> footage while you were in France when you were filming this, not putting this wildly grainy film clip. Yeah. I will say... I don't know what's going on here, y'all. I will say, I did like the ending, which is that Poirot takes uh, Jap to a a museum. Oh, yeah, that was sweet. After Jap admits, like, I actually do like this French cuisine now. I'm becoming quite partial to it. And I'll bring it back to a two and a half just because of Jap and how much we see of him and how good he is in this episode. But Tyler, what what do you rate it? Um, now hearing that, I'm going to put it down to one and a half because then we this should have been the pilot to just Jap. <laughs> I didn't need this in the Poirot series. <laughs> uh, door pilot. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to give it a two and a half as well. Uh, for many of the same reasons that you've already stated, it's just, it's muddy, uh, it's, yeah, too much detail where there doesn't need to be, not enough detail where there does, it's kind of hard to follow, <laughs> as I think you can probably gather from our our recounting of the story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's such a shame, because I think the concept is so strong. Yeah. yeah, it should have been a short story rather rather than a novel. Yeah, and right. I didn't I didn't really like the novel very much either. I don't remember. I'll have to go back and listen to it. And I think uh, 
my the thoughts episode, at the time I mean. were that like I just wish it all took place on the plane. Yeah, yeah. like like Murder on the Orient Express, because mm-hmm. uh, that's where Murder on the Orient Express is so strong. Is that you know there's the urgency of the place uh, that we have to get it figured out in mm-hmm. in this before we get to the station, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that that helps create a, a really wonderful tension where, yeah, and I think that because uh, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page for the book uh, of the of Death in the Clouds, and it also references um, the confined space um, thing uh, and Murder on the Orient Express and also mentions the blue train. So the blue mm-hmm. train is also one where they get off the frickin train for most of the episode or the book, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's why that's why Orient Express is so much stronger than mm-hmm. Blue Train mm-hmm. or or Death in the Clouds because you get off the you get off the um, confined vehicle or whatever and uh, it just kind of all gets too muddy. What about the- this? A sequel to Snakes on a Plane, but with Poirot <laughs> and bees. Death- yeah, after Death on an Isle, the next Kenneth Branagh one is just snakes on a plane. I'm here for it. Bees on a si- plane. Bees on this plane. I'm sick of these bees on this <laughs> bee plane. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. All right. We got some writing to do. Oh, yeah. For the pilot. Yeah. yeah. We. I, I assume we're writing this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think it can Her. only be us. Yeah. yeah. And with yeah. that, I call this meeting of the Amateur Detective Club to a close. A buzz, buzz, buzz.